Christ is in our midst. Good morning, Kalima. I've, I've mentioned uh, this before, but the Orthodox Church likes to take the feast days and sort of enlarge them. One, I guess you could say for the Orthodox Christian Church, one day for a feast day just isn't enough. And so, as you may know, certainly you do know, uh, for example, such feasts as Christmas, which is just six days away, we have a 40-day period prior to Christmas, right, of fasting, where we reflect on, on the themes of Christmas and we sort of enlarge the scope of Christmas, in a sense. Um, and today's Gospel reading is actually an example of this. Um, today's Gospel reading, which we just read from Matthew, is specifically prescribed for the Sunday before Christmas. So every single Sunday, every year, the Sunday before Christmas, this is the Gospel reading we hear. <clears throat> and so um, today, what I'd like to do is, uh, well I should say, when, when I tell my children, last night we read the Gospel reading, and without fail, when I tell my children that the Gospel reading is the genealogy, there is a, what we would call a communal groan, right? As if to say, oh no, not the genealogy again. But, but in fact, really, the more we look at the genealogy, the more we see that there is to find. There's a lot of layers, and some of it is under sediment, so we have to dig through the sediment to get to the layers. But today I want to dig through that sediment, and I want to offer what I would call four dimensions of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ as shown to us in this genealogy reading. Now all these dimensions, I, I, I'll say as a preface, relate to Jesus Christ as a son, as a son, S-O-N. Uh, and so I've named them accordingly. So the first dimension that we see in the genealogy readings, we see from this reading that Jesus Christ is the son of a promise, the son of a promise, all right? Bear with me. Today's reading, in verse 2, we hear Abraham was the father of Isaac. Abraham was the father of Isaac, right? Now, as you may know, all of the Jews, right, by definition, all of the Jews trace themselves back to Abraham. Abraham is the patriarch of the whole tribe of Israel, right? He was also the man with whom God made a very significant, a very important promise, right? In the book of Genesis, we read, and this is God speaking, I, God, will surely bless you, Abraham, and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, or seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now here we have God telling Abraham, that because of his obedience, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through his offspring, right? And now we need to jump to the side here and do a little, little bit of Hebrew, a little bit of Hebrew 101. The word offspring, or seed in the Hebrew, is in the singular. It's in the singular, right? So it's not a reference to the tribe of Israel. It's not a reference to all the Jews. It's a reference to one particular offspring of Abraham, right? And of course, our understanding is that that was Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But I, I don't bring that up because I like studying Hebrew. I bring it up because it tells us something important about God, right? It tells us that God <clears throat> makes and keeps his promises. God makes and keeps his promises, right? He promised Abraham that through his offspring, all the nations would be blessed, right? And he kept that promise in, in the birth of Christ, which we celebrate this Saturday. Jesus Christ himself promised that he would die and rise again, right? And he kept that promise. Jesus said that after he rose, 50 days later, he would send the Holy Spirit on the church, right? And he kept that promise, right? And maybe most importantly for us, Jesus Christ promised that he will come again as a judge. And quote, all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Right, so that is dimension number one that we see in today's gospel, that Jesus Christ is the son of a promise 
and that God is a promise keeper. Dimension number two is that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man, the Son of Man. And here I'll offer two verses from the reading. Verse three, we hear, quote, Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. And verse six, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Now, why are these verses significant? Because both of these stories, if we go back to the Old Testament and read them, maybe you have, uh, are frankly rather scandalous. They're actually, they're incredibly scandalous, really. To summarize them, Judah sleeps with his daughter-in-law, who is pretending to be a prostitute, gets her pregnant, and the child from that, Perez was his name, is an ancestor of Jesus Christ. And David, the second verse, sleeps with the wife of one of the chief generals in his army, gets her pregnant, and then to cover up this event, has the general, the husband of the woman he slept with, has him killed, right? Pretty horrible stuff, I would say. And yet these are the great, 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 great however many greats, grandparents of our Lord and Savior, the Messiah who came to save the world from sin. How is that possible? We don't really know, but we do know that in Jesus Christ, God became man so that he could taste everything that we experience in life, every single thing, right? He was hungry, he was thirsty, he was in prison, he was beaten, and of course, the climax of it all, he died on the cross, innocent of any crime claimed to be against him, right? And maybe that clarifies how it is possible that David and Judah could be the ancestors of our Lord, right? Because there was nothing Jesus Christ wasn't willing to taste. Even murder and adultery and incest and every other horrible thing you can imagine, right? He took all of our humanity on himself so that he could redeem all of humanity. That is dimension number two. Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. Dimension number three, he is the Son of David. Now why does this, uh, the verse is, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Why does this matter? It matters because this was part of the promise, right? Kind of back at, at dimension number one. God speaks to Nathan the prophet about David, and he says the following to him, 2 Samuel 7. <clears throat> but my love will never be taken away from him, David and his children. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And so the Jews expected someone who could trace their genealogy back to David to be the final king, sort of the, the keeping of this promise. And it's interesting that in the Gospels, multiple times, you see people addressing Jesus as the son of David, right? Now, on Palm Sunday, we hear, quote, Hosanna to the son of David, right? When Jesus heals the blind Bartimaeus, quote, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And after healing a demon-possessed man, we are told, quote, and all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? And this title, son of David, we should note, was more than just a, a sort of a genealogical declaration. It was more than just saying, you know, his great, 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 great grandfather was David, right? The term son of David was code for the Messiah. It was code for the Messiah, right? Son of David meant that Jesus was the one that the Jews had been waiting for. He was the one prophesied by Moses and all the prophets. Everything God's people were waiting for has arrived in the person of Jesus Christ. So that is dimension number three, that Jesus is the son of David. Lastly, and maybe most significantly, today's gospel tells us that Jesus Christ is the son of God. He is the son of God. Verses 22 and 23 from the reading. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. If there is one unique feature to Christianity that no other religion on the planet can claim, it is that God has become man. God's love for his creation is such that he couldn't just safely sit up on a cloud in heaven and watch his creation unravel. Right? Rather, 
His love was so much that he became one of us and experienced all of human life, all of the good and all of the ill, right? And that is probably the best closing point for my sermon today. So as we speedily approach uh, the great feast day of Christmas, just uh, six days away, a day of, of feasting and fellowship and time with family and friends, may we also keep at the center of this day the work that God has done for us and the promises he has kept for us in the person of Jesus Christ, right? The promise <clears throat> that he kept through Abraham and David, the willingness to enter fully into the self-inflicted mess that is our world, right? Think Judah and King David. And lastly, his uniting of our humanity with his divinity, so that as he shared in our human nature, we can hope someday, may it be the case, to share in his divinity unto the ages of ages. Amen. Please rise.